All right, so for this lecture, for unit three, we're going to cover the metabolism of aromatic amino acids. Aromatic amino acids are named as such because they have an aromatic ring as part of their structure. And the aromatic amino acids include phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Phenylalanine and tryptophan are essential amino acids that are required for protein synthesis. Tyrosine, on the other hand, can be synthesized by the body, so it's a non essential amino acid. However, all three of these are used for the synthesis of biologically active molecules such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and then they can also be broken down into molecules used in gluconeogenesis. So the aromatic amino acids are very important because they contribute to a lot of biological functions. So this is a figure in your book that outlines the metabolism of phenylalanine and tyrosine specifically. So we'll start here with phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine, which is catalyzed by the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, which requires tetrahydrobioterin or BH4 as a cofactor. And then if we look here at the, at the diagram, tyrosine through a series of steps gets converted into homogenistic acid, which is then further converted into malleal acetoacetic acid, which is catalyzed by the enzyme homogenosate oxidase, which is shown here with letter A. And then malleal acetoacetic acid is converted into fumarol acetoacetate. And then fumarol acetoacetate is converted by fumarol acetoacetate hydrolase into fumarate and acetoacetate. And what's important about this is that the end product of tyrosine breakdown is fumarate, which can then enter the citric acid cycle and contribute to that. Now, if we're starting here with tyrosine, tyrosine can be synthesized from phenylalanine, so it's not an essential amino acid. And then it's used to synthesize dopamine, catecholamines, and thyroid hormones. Now the first step in tyrosine breakdown involves being converted to hydroxyphenylalanine or DOPA, and this is catalyzed by the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase, which also requires BH4 as a cofactor. So you see that here, tyrosine gets converted into DOPA. Now in this figure, we've indicated where this pathway stops depending on which tissue you're in. And the reason the pathway would stop is because the particular tissue doesn't have the enzymes to catalyze the next steps in the reaction. So if we're in skin here, DOPA can be converted into melanin, which is the pigment in skin, by the enzyme tyrosinase. Now, if we go beyond skin to include non-nervous peripheral tissue, so any tissue that's not neurons, DOPA is then converted into dopamine by the enzyme DOPA decarboxylase. So this is a small error in your book, and you should make sure that you just put the D in front of carboxylase here. So DOPA decarboxylase also requires vitamin B6 as a cofactor. And then a fun fact here is that DOPA decarboxylase is inhibited by the drug car carbidopa, which is used to treat Parkinson's disease with the goal of decreasing dopamine. So if, if you're in non-nervous peripheral tissue, the pathway stops here. If you have excess dopamine, it gets converted into homovanillic acid. Now that when you expand to include neurons and nervous tissue, dopamine is converted into norepinephrine, and this is catalyzed by the enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase, which requires vitamin C as a cofactor. Now in most neurons, such as in peripheral nerves, this is the final step of the pathway. You end with norepinephrine, and it's used as a neurotransmitter. And in these tissues, excess norepinephrine is converted into normetinephrine by the enzyme catechyl O-methyltransferase, and then normetinephrine can be further degraded into vanillamandelic acid, also known as VMA. And then the last step of this pathway, which is mostly contained to the adrenal medulla and maybe some neurons, but mainly you want to think of this as just the adrenal medulla, this last step where norepinephrine is converted into epinephrine is catalyzed by the enzyme phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, and it requires methylation from S-adenosylmethionine, SAM, which we've talked about in some previous lectures. SAM essentially is a methyl donor. That's how you want to think of it. And this enzyme that catalyzes th this reaction, phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, is actually stimulated by the hormone cortisol. Now remember, cortisol is secreted in response to stress. And so that makes sense that if you're stressed or you're very nervous about something, you're going you're gonna to have what is casually known as an adrenaline rush. And that's where you, know, you would secrete cortisol, which would then stimulate in the adrenal medulla the synthesis of epinephrine and norepinephrine. When you have excess epinephrine, it's converted into metanephrine, which is also degraded to VMA. And clinically, what's important to know is, is there's a rare type of tumor that can be found in the adrenal medulla known as a pheochromocytoma. And one of the ways you, you diagnose that is you actually measure urine levels of VMA. 
And then also urine levels of VMA can also be di- used to diagnose another type of t- tumor called a neuroblastoma as well. So definitely be aware of that as well. That's why we've included these degradation products because those can come up as test questions for those particular tumors. So tryptophan is used to synthesize niacin, which is a form of vitamin B3. It is also used to synthesize serotonin and melatonin. So for serotonin synthesis in the brain, you start with tryptophan. It gets converted into 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan, which is catalyzed by the enzyme tryptophan 5-hydroxylase. And then you take 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan and convert it into serotonin, which is catalyzed by the enzyme 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan decarboxylase, which requires vitamin B6. Then you can further convert serotonin into melatonin through these steps. So serotonin combines with acetyl-CoA, and that forms N-acetyl-serotonin and coenzyme A. Then you take that N-acetyl-serotonin, combine it with SAM, or S-adenosylmethionine, which is a methyl donor, and you convert it into melatonin. Now in the liver, tryptophan is broken down into niacin. This process produces an alanine that can be used in gluconeogenesis, and then niacin itself can be utilized to synthesize NAD+, and NADP+. All right, so now we're going to go over some clinical pearls relevant to aromatic amino acids. So first, phenylketonuria. So this is a very high-yield disorder. You could definitely see this on a biochemistry exam, on a board exam. And this is caused by decreased phenylalanine hydroxylase activity. Now remember, that's the enzyme that's responsible for converting phenylalanine to tyrosine. So you can have decreased activity of that enzyme, or you can have decreased BH4, because remember, BH4 is a cofactor for phenylalanine hydroxylase. So even if you have normal levels and normal activity, of phenylalanine hydroxylase, if you have decreased levels of BH4, the enzyme can't function properly. So this is known as malignant PKU subtype. The way you can tell the difference between these two is by measuring the levels of dopamine. And the reason for that is because tyrosine is converted to dopa, and then dopa is then converted to dopamine. But tyrosine converted to dopa is catalyzed by an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, as we talked about. This enzyme also requires BH4. So if you're deficient in BH4, it's going to affect phenylalanine hydroxylase, and then it's also going to affect tyrosine hydroxylase. So you're going to have decreased levels of DOPA and decreased levels of dopamine. And then also, if you have decreased levels of dopamine, you're going to have increased levels of prolactin because dopamine acts as an inhibitor of prolactin secretion in the, in the pituitary. And so this is a way you can, you can distinguish between which, what is the exact cause. Now, regardless of the cause, either one is going to result in high levels of phenylalanine. And that's because this enzyme can't carry out its function of converting phenylalanine to tyrosine, so you have high levels of phenylalanine. And then phenylalanine can be broken down into phenylketones. And one way you diagnose this is you can see increased levels of phenylketones in the urine. And specifically, phenyl ketones that you would see are phenyl acetate, phenyl lactate, and phenyl pyruvate. And you definitely want to be familiar with these terms because they could show up at, on a, as an answer choice on an exam. It could, you know, the stem, it could be very obvious that it's phenyl ketone urea. And then they could ask you what's found on a urine analysis. And then they would, you know, obviously list a bunch of different answer choices. And this would be one of them. And so you want to be aware of this so you can get the question right. The other thing is that tyrosine levels are below normal because of this enzyme defect because you're not synthesizing tyrosine. So that results in tyrosine becoming an essential amino acid. PKU is an autosomal recessive inheritance. Now, the thing about patients with phenylketonuria is during development, they're actually normal because they can rely on the maternal phenylalanine hydroxylase. And, the th- and so what that means is that clinically, this, it's really important for this disorder to be discovered very early so that it can be treated because high levels of phenylalanine are very toxic. And so if it's not treated, phenylalanine can build up and cause toxicity for tissues and really affect normal development. And if that happens, you can see patients with mental retardation or growth failure. They can develop a peculiar body odor. Sometimes this is described as musty. And then it can also affect pigment in their hair and their skin. So you can see white, fair skin or blonde hair and then eczema. And then it also affects neurological development. And so you can see hyper or hypotonia, seizures, and then neurotoxicity. The way you would treat this is you would decrease intake of phenylalanine. you got to decrease levels of phenylalanine so it cannot exert these toxic effects. 
You supplement with tyrosine because it's now an essential amino acid because you can't synthesize it. And then you strictly avoid aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener that contains phenylalanine. And this can definitely be asked on a, on a test as well. That's why we included it here. Now, as a result of this, all newborns receive a mandatory screening for PKU at two to three days after birth for the sole purpose of hopefully detecting this and intervening early to prevent any of these clinical features from developing. And this, again, stems from the fact that these patients are normal at birth. They're not going to exhibit any of these symptoms right away because, again, they still have maternal phenylalanine hydroxylase left over that was received while in utero. Now, another type is you have maternal PKU, and this occurs when a mother with PKU does not receive strict diet therapy during pregnancy. And so as a result of that, they pass on abnormally high levels of phenyl ketones onto their developing fetus. This can result in the infant developing microcephaly, intellectual disability, growth retardation, and congenital heart defects. So the next disorder we'll talk about is alcaptinuria, which is a deficiency of homogenousate oxidase which is responsible for converting homogenistic acid into malleal acetoacetic acid. So if this step doesn't occur, you have a buildup of homogenistic acid, which is broken down into these pigmented polymers, which then deposit in collagen. And this particularly affects cartilage within joints. So what happens is, is these patients don't really have many noticeable symptoms in childhood and early adulthood because these polymers are depositing in collagen over a period of time. And so these patients don't really see symptoms until after about age 30, which at that time enough of these have deposited in the collagen of their cartilage within the joints, and so they develop joint pain as a result of that and other musculoskeletal problems. The inheritance for this is autosomal recessive. So for the clinical features, those polymers that I was talking about on the previous slide are actually pigmented. And they're, they're, they give connective tissue a blue-black appearance, which is called ochronosis. These pigmented polymers can also be deposited in the urine, which gives urine also that blue-black color. This is actually something you can see during childhood and early adulthood if you're looking for it. But otherwise, other symptoms, like I said, don't really occur until after 30. And then also connective tissue in the sclera can also have this blue-black color as well. Now, after age 30, patients can develop arthralgia, which is pain in the joints, and then they can also have cartilage damage in the hip, knee, and spine. There's no real good treatment for this disorder. The main thing that you do to manage it is just manage their symptoms. So tyrosinosis, this is a deficiency of fumarol acetoacetate hydrolase, which is the enzyme responsible for forming fumarate and acetoacetate from fumarol acetoacetate. And so if you have a defect in this enzyme, you have a buildup of fumarol acetoacetate, and then things get backlogged here, and then you also have high levels of tyrosine as well. So fumarol acetoacetate accumulates particularly in the liver and the kidney, and then it results in oxidative damage to those tissues. Now, in the liver, that leads to cirrhosis, hepatitis, and then liver cancer, such as hepatocellular carcinoma, and then it also, in the kidney, causes significant damage as well. The way you treat this is you restrict tyrosine in the diet. And then you can give this drug called nitisinone, which essentially blocks the degradation of tyrosine all the way down to fumarol acetoacetate, and so you decrease the accumulation of this, which can help protect against some of this oxidative damage. And then lastly here, albinism, which is caused by tyrosinase deficiency. And in the skin here, tyrosinase is responsible for converting dopa into melanin, which is the pigment within skin. And so these patients, as a result of that, they have decreased melanin, which results in an absence of pigmentation. And so that leads to white skin, pale hair, and pink eyes, and then that can increase the risk for skin cancer. Because remember, the pigmentation helps protect against the sun, so these patients are at increased risk of skin cancers as a result of that. All right, so that closes out our discussion of aromatic amino acids and their relevant clinical pearls.